Okay, get ready. Uh, we are going to be jumping into Matthew chapter uh, 24, starting in verse 32. Uh, we're going through Matthew verse by verse. Uh, we have been in Matthew for now uh, almost 14 months. Uh, some people ask why we do this. I, it's funny, I get uh, different emails that request at different times. Some people want me to uh, speak more about moral issues or politics, and some people want me to speak more about prophecy and those kind of things. And our commitment here is we go verse by verse through books of the Bible. Uh, why do I do that? Because it's easy for us to find some aspect of theology or something that we really like, and we tend to focus on that to the neglect of the rest of the Word of God. My calling is to teach the whole counsel of God. And I will be held accountable for that. And so that's why we choose. I choose Old Testament books. Then I usually jump to a gospel. Then I jump to Paul's epistles. And we cover those things. Um, some churches never talk about prophecy. That's not good. To me, they open themselves up to deception. Some people, some churches, that's all they talk about. <laughs> and to me, that's dangerous too because you can become distracted and forget the whole counsel of God is designed to teach us. It just so happens that the way the Lord worked in my life, I, I graduated from three different seminaries. All three seminaries had different views when it came to eschatology and prophecy. I didn't plan it that way. It's just the way where I lived and the, how the Lord led. I'm thankful that was the case because the last seminary I went to was a reform seminary up near Philly. And I'm, I'm a pretty committed, uh, firm, dispensational, uh, premillennial thinker. And I can remember in one class in this reform seminary where that issue came up. And when I told them I believed in a rapture, they looked at me like I was the craziest person in the room. Uh, I think they thought I was the one with seven heads and ten horns and all those other things. And I remember talking with them, and I just realized these are people that love the Lord, love Scripture, were studying Scripture, but had come to a totally different conclusion. Didn't change my view, but it... It humbled me enough to say that this is not so clear, that if you have someone on a YouTube channel who's got it all figured out, just be very, very careful. Um, I like this quote by Douglas O'Donnell. Uh, he's a, uh, the author of Preaching the Word Bible Commentary. He said this, a third century, that's that big long quote, <laughs> a third century Roman clergyman calculated that Jesus would return in AD 500 based on the dimensions of Noah's Ark. Christ did not return. On January 1st, 1,000, many Christians in Europe predicted the end of the world. As the year approached, Christian armies traveled to some of the pagan countries in northern Europe in order to make converts by force, if necessary, before Christ returned. Christ did not return. Pope Innocent III took the number 618, the year Islam was founded, and added the number 666, the number of the beast, to get 1284 as the year of Christ's final judgment. Christ did not return. On February 14, 1835, Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Latter-day Saints, announced that Jesus would return within 56 years. Christ did not return. William Miller, uh, Larry, that's your grandfather? No, okay. <laughs> William Miller predicted that, uh, oh, well, let's say, predicted that the second coming would occur on October 22, 1844. Christ did not return. 1874, Charles Taz Russell, from which came the Jehovah's Witnesses, predicted the rapture in 1910, followed by the end of the world and Christ's return in 1914. Christ did not return. 1988, Ed, Edgar Wisnett wrote the book 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is in 1988. Christ did not return. One final example, Harold Camping predicted the end of the world. He advertised on 55 radio stations and on 6,000 billboards. Judgment Day is coming, May 21st, 2011. The Bible guarantees it. Christ did not return. Those false claims are no laughing matter, for those who made such empty claims brought Christ and Christianity into disrepute. Those who made them were either ignorant of or disobedient to Jesus' clearest statement in the often unclear Olivet Discourse. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Jesus is saying clearly, only God knows. <laughs> um, it's interesting. I, I was in New Jersey uh, when the whole Harold Camping thing, I don't know how popular he was down here. He was fairly popular up in our area. Some people assume Harold Camping was just, if you're not familiar with him, you assume he was just a nutcase. Uh, the guy was, uh, had an engineering degree from University of California from Berkeley. He was a civil engineer in the military. He was a brilliant mathematician. Uh, he just, <laughs> his problem was 
He was part of a church fellowship, and in 1988, he left that church fellowship. And he did not go to another local church. He sort of had his own little thing going on. And he had his own radio program, so he felt like that was sort of his church, but he had zero accountability. Uh, in 2008, I actually remember being in New Jersey when someone came to me and said, Harold Camping said, all local churches are apostate and that everyone should leave, that all pastors were apostate shepherds. Well, that's really nice and convenient. And so what's the application? Everyone should leave their church and listen to his radio show. Uh, he, and he wrote a real long paper. Someone gave it to me of all the reasons. And it just had scripture verse after scripture verse after scripture verse all taken out of context. But it really did mess up this person a little bit. And she was wondering if our church was an apostate church. Um, he predicted the end of the world on May 21st, 2011. A lot of people uh, believed him. Uh, he spent $100 million on radio ads and uh, billboards. Uh, I'm thinking, how did he get $100 million? Well, probably all those people that were following him like he had something that no one else had. And there was a bus that said, um, uh, what did it say? Have you heard the awesome news? The end of the world is almost here. And they went around and apparently uh, spread their message. This is what... Uh, <coughs> that's what upsets me more than anything. The Bible guarantees it. I can tell you what the Bible guarantees is that he didn't know. <laughs> and he thought he did. I did find it interesting. I don't know if they did this on purpose, that they happened to camp out by, <laughs> by that sign. You think that was, uh, that might have been planned. You're either going up or you're staying down. I don't know. That was something. But people took, and, and this almost sounds like a joke, but... There was literally, and it's still out there, after the rapture, pet care came for that. There was a lady who believed the rapture was coming, and she was concerned about her pets. And so uh, she <laughs> recruited a network of people that she knew that were not believers. <laughs> and uh, they paid her money, uh, or she... Asked for registration fees, and you could register your pet, and she had this network so that when you're gone, these people, these uh, unbelievers, will come take care of your pets. Um, it's a legitimate website. It seems to be a legitimate thing, because, uh, and it's just like, wow. Interesting that Peter says this, the end of all things is at hand. Here's your therefore. Be of sound thinking and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. That to me, when people ask me, when people think the end is near, and I, I do think it is near, uh, and they say, what do we do? What do we do? How do we live? I said, you live in the last day like you're called to live every day. <laughs> We're called to be faithful. Um, there's been Christians for 2,000 years. Many of them thought the, the end was going to happen in their lifetime. How are they supposed to live? Faithful to God. If, you're live, if, if the last day means that you're going to live somehow differently, then that means you're not living really well every day. Every day I am to live with this expectation that Christ could come back. But that's not craziness. Uh, that is being of sound thinking, which means that you, and sober spirit, means that you have humility and you have sanity. Uh, why? So that you can pray. The reason God reveals these things is so that if you look around and you see the whole world falling apart, you should be the one person who is not falling apart because you have a confidence that goes beyond the news and everything that the world is throwing. Um, you should not be a wild-eyed, crazy person. You should be someone who is walking daily, faithful to the Lord with a confidence knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, as we get to the Olivet Discourse, there's a lot of different views. I put this quote by uh, Douglas Moo. Uh, he's a professor of Trinity Evangelical School, and I think he was at Wheaton College as well. Most scholars have noted that the Olivet Discourse is the most difficult portion of the Gospels to interpret. I think that's important to realize. Everyone who interprets the Olivet Discourse is going to meet some interpretive challenges. Um, even those that hold a, a dispensational premillennialism view are going to encounter some interpretive challenges. I think this view makes the most sense. I think it puts uh, all things in their proper place. 
but it's not without its challenges. And so as we work through this, I want you to appreciate some of the challenges because I think that will help you be more discerning when someone teaches something and acts like everything is figured out and they're the ones by their tapes, by their video series, because they're the ones who finally figured it out. Uh, that's just foolishness if you go down that path. When you hear the word dispensational, I don't know what your background is. For some people, it means absolutely nothing. Um, for some people, they've heard the worst of dispensationalism. Uh, I had someone ask me, you know, when I think of dispensationalists, they told me what they think of. And I'll, I'll say, uh, <laughs> I've said this before, most of the nutcakes are in our camp. <laughs> Uh, the ones who think they got the dates and the one that have all these kind of uh, convoluted mathematical equations and are trying to figure everything out and who's the Antichrist. Uh, there's a lot of nutcakes in our camp. Unfortunately, they, I think, color uh, a view that I think is a biblical view. If you want to just sum up what dispensationalism is, uh, Charles Ryrie said that basically it means this. I believe that the prophecies in the Old Testament of a coming kingdom where Israel's at the centerpiece, I believe those are literal prophecies. I think God is going to honor his word. And I also believe that the church has not replaced Israel, but God is going to use ethnic national Israel in the future. And those are the two main things. It, it can be developed in a lot of other ways. But here's what's so important. All the covenants in the Old Testament, Abrahamic covenant, David, Davidic covenant, new covenant, you know who those covenants are made with? <laughs> They're made with Israel. They're made with the Jewish people. How do we participate? We're grafted in, but the roots are the Abrahamic covenant. The roots are the Jewish nation. Uh, God is still going to use them. If God did not use them in the future and they exist as a failed nation, then I, I have a hard time believing that God is a redemptive God because he is going to redeem Israel's failure. And all those covenants being made with Israel, he is going to fulfill. So what do I believe? I believe there's Old Testament age, Messiah comes. Instead of being received, he is crucified. Uh, he, raise, he's, he rises again. And now we live in what's called the church age. I believe the clock has stopped. If, if you're going to understand this, you have to understand Daniel's prophecy. In fact, Jesus even says it. Well, Matthew says it uh, in verse 15. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and then Matthew pops in, whoever reads, let him understand. He's saying, and if you're going to understand this, you're going to have to go back and understand Daniel. I believe 69 weeks of Daniel have passed uh, regarding his people, the nation of Israel and Jerusalem, and the clock stopped. Why did the clock stop? Because if Christ would have established his kingdom when he first came, none of us would have qualified. He, the clock stops so that the message can go out to the nations. Uh, when you trust in Jesus Christ, at that moment you become a kingdom citizen. Your citizenship changes and you become aligned with, as a kingdom citizen of the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom that is going to come to earth. And we're to take that message to the world. At some point, things are going to kick in and there's going to be a seven-year time of tribulation. That's Daniel's 70th week. Uh, it's called the day of the Lord. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's called the tribulation. It's called the birth pains of the kingdom. At some point, that is going to kick in, and I believe that before that kicks in, the church is going to be raptured because God is going to take his church, uh, which consists of Jews and Gentiles, but he's going to take his church so that then he can begin to work through the nation of Israel again. Israel is going to fulfill their mission, which they did not fill, fulfill in the Old Testament. That's why if you re read Revelation 7, um, right as the seals are being opened, uh, Jesus stops things and seals 144,000 Jewish people. Uh, those are not Jehovah's Witnesses. Those are Jewish people that he seals to be witnesses during this time. There will be a great harvest of people during the tribulation, but uh, the consequence of believing in Jesus during that time is almost certain death, uh, though God will protect some. So that's the view that I bring into this. So all the discourse, disciples basically ask two questions. How is the world going to end and when is the world going to end? Two big questions that we normally ask. I believe Jesus answered the first one or the second one, how it's going to end or what are the signs in verses uh, 4 through 14. He describes the tribulation. Verses 15 through uh, 28, he describes the second half of the tribulation, which will be very intense. He says it's going to be worse than anything that has ever occurred on this earth. 
And if you try to fathom what that means, I think it should sober all of us. Um, if you can think through the worst atrocities and tragedies that have happened in this world, and Jesus says this will be uh, ten times worse, then Christ will come. Uh, everything will be, <laughs> it's wild. All the natural light will be uh, covered over, uh, whether that's nuclear, whether it's asteroids, I don't know, but somehow there's going to be so much uh, debris in the atmosphere that it will block the sun and the moon and the light of the stars. And at the same time, it says the powers of the heavens will be shaken. This is just my theory. But if there was some kind of electromagnet kind of shock wave, it would knock out all electrical lights. <laughs> so imagine all natural light gone, all electrical uh, systems shut down. You're talking about a darkness that would be like if you've ever been down into a cave when they, there's no light. And in the midst of that darkness, suddenly the Shekinah glory of Jesus Christ is going to just split open the sky. And you want to talk about a brightness that will <laughs> contrast with the, the darkness that's in this world, and everyone will see the glory of Jesus Christ coming. That's where we ended last week in verses 29 through 31. Let's pick up now in verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the very doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. If you did that little study guide in your uh, bulletin, I had you focus on things that we know and things that we don't know. And I think that's key. There are certain things that we can know. There are certain things that we can't know. And we should be uh, satisfied that God, the secret things belong to him, and he reveals some things to us, and he doesn't reveal other things. What can we know, though? Uh, well, one, we should know that we can be hopeful. We are to be a people of hope because we know that God is a God of hope. And he tells us some things that we can know. First thing we can know is from the parable of the fig tree, when its branch has become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. And so there's a fig tree right there. Um, that's a good picture of one. And again, what's the significance of a fig tree? Well, there's actually a lot of rabbinical scholars that believe that the fruit that Adam and Eve ate was a fig tree. Um, uh, apple was not as natural to them. And so fig trees had it sort of a... Because uh, what did they cover themselves with after they sinned, by the way? A fig leaf. Um, fig trees have always seemed to be associated with God's people. And if you go back to the triumphal entry, we talked about the fact that Jesus shows he's king, he shows he's priest by cleansing the temple, then he shows his prophet by pronouncing judgment on the fig tree. Now, why did he, what does he have against fig trees? Why did he pronounce judgment? Because the fig tree, I believe, was a picture of that generation of Jewish people. If that's the case, then you'd have to say here that fig tree seems to be somehow tied to the nation of Israel. And you can also see that throughout Scripture, uh, the way you could describe the coming kingdom or the way you could describe a time of peace was everyone sat under their own fig tree. That, for a Jewish person, that's like the ultimate peace is when you can sit under your own fig tree. Uh, here's Micah. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And we're like, amen. That's, that's, what, that's the longing the world has for peace. And there's such strong uh, emphasis on peace. And here's how he describes it. And everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. <laughs> and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts uh, has spoken. In our culture, we'd probably say, and everyone will sit on their hammock between their two big old oak trees and, and sip lemonade. It's sort of that picture of whatever you picture as serenity and peace, that's how they pictured the fig tree. So what does it mean that when you see the fig tree starting to put forth leaves, you know summer is near and you should know that things are near at the door? Hal Lindsey, who is a Dallas grad and I think has written a lot of good stuff, he assumed that 1948, we see Israel become a nation. He assumed a generation was 40 years. He assumed 1988. Uh, that's why he wrote The Late Great Planet Earth. That's when you start going too far. <laughs> 
We don't know exactly. Is it 1948? Could be. Is it 1967 when Israel gained control of the Temple Mount? Could be. Could there be another date when something happens in Israel that really clarifies them as a nation, not only maybe a nation of a secular nation, but maybe a nation that has more of a heart of faith? We just don't know. We also don't know what a generation is. It could be 30 years. It could be 40 years. It could be 70 years. It could be 100 years. There's different um, numbers given. All I can say is this. Somehow the fig tree is related to Israel, and if you want to understand the times, you have to keep your eye on the nation of Israel. Um, Israel, God has a plan, and God has a calendar, and that calendar somehow is tied to the nation of Israel. I do think what happened in 1948 was a miracle. <laughs> and Israel being in the land today is something that could not have been foreseen. And to me, when that happened, everyone who was not a dispensational premillennial should have become one. <laughs> but... Regardless of that, I do think there's something obviously tied to Israel, and when you see Israel starting to blossom, then you should at least know the time could be getting close, but we don't know exactly how long that might be. And so, uh, then he says this, assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things are fulfilled. This creates all kinds of interpretive challenges for a lot of people. Most people would say, well, this has to be the generation that's hearing Jesus speak. Um, every time he uses this generation in Matthew, he's talking about, uh, it seems to be talking about that generation at that time. Uh, some people say that generation can also be translated as um, ethnicity. In other words, uh, this ethnicity, this Jewish people shall not pass away until all of this is fulfilled. God's going to protect his people, which is a great promise because at the time it looked like they could be destroyed. Or he could be talking about the future generation. I think he's talking about this future generation that is going to see some of this stuff starting to happen. In fact, he says, when you see all these things, know that it's near at the very doors. If you take that real strictly, you would say once the tribulation starts, it's not going to take very long. And so that generation is not going to pass away. Um, I think if you want to try to tie it to something in Israel, you can start getting into the weeds, and that can be a little bit more dangerous. But I do believe that it is the future generation living in the tribulation. I like what MacArthur says. The simple and most reasonable interpretation is that this generation refers to the people living at the end time who will view those signs, which makes sense. When it starts, it's going to happen quickly. I do think that he's making a contrast. At the end of chapter 23, this generation is going to face judgment, and Israel as a nation is going to face a judgment from God which happened. But there's going to be a future, this generation, who's going to be part of God's salvation. And that's where you see in Romans 11 that all Israel will be saved. God is going to, again, redeem his people. And so I think he is contrasting those two. And so that's my understanding of that. Um, and then finally, the last thing we can be assured of is that Jesus' words are more certain than the sun rising tomorrow. <laughs> um, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Jesus' words are more sure than the sun rising this, this morning. How many people woke up at about 5 o'clock this morning and were very panicky, hoping that the sun would rise this morning? Okay, if, if that is the case, then, uh, yeah, I, I won't say it, but you should probably seek some counseling, but... None of us do. Why? Because we have become convinced that this world operates like a clock. But why? I mean, I've told you this so many times, you probably get sick of me hearing it. Right now, as we sit here, this world, this earth is rotating 1,000 miles per hour. We are orbiting the sun at 67,000 miles per hour, and the whole solar system is moving at 448,000 miles per hour. Right now. I mean, this is going on right now. There is no guarantee that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. I mean, there's a lot of things that have to be in order. It's interesting. I read an article that said the only reason we don't feel all that motion is because it is so constant, you don't feel it. Like if you're on an airplane that's going 100 however fast they go, a lot of times you can almost feel like you're just sitting in your living room because it's a consistent speed. Now, when you hit turbulence <laughs> or the speed drops or whatever, then you notice that you're in motion. And we don't hit any turbulence. I mean, we're just cruising along like, like this is all supposed to happen. If we're that convinced that God can sustain the universe 
Why do we doubt that he's going to fulfill his words? His words are more sure. And if you're not worried about the sun rising each day, then just know this. Jesus Christ is going to reign on this earth. And God is moving all things according to the counsel of his will. Even if the whole world falls apart, the believer does not have to fall apart because my confidence is not in the news. My confidence is, thank the Lord, not in our politics. Uh, My confidence is not in the UN. My confidence isn't in Elon Musk or Bill Gates or whoever thinks they have solutions. My confidence is in the word of God, which has stood the test of time. And this is what you have to cling to. I like what uh, Robert Deffenbaugh says. Jesus' words will outlast heaven and earth. If we value things on the basis of how long they will last, nothing has greater value than the word of God. And so we're to be hopeful. I don't know if anybody saw this. uh, (laughs) The doomsday clock was revealed last week. Uh, Anybody watch that? Good. They actually have a doomsday clock. It's put out by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. That sounds so impressive. These are the guys that must know because they're the atomic scientists. Um, I don't even know what that means. I don't think they know what it means, but it sounds impressive. It started by uh, Einstein and Oppenheimer, and once the nuclear age came, they just had this clock that said how long we have till we're all going to die. And it started off at seven minutes till midnight. Midnight's when we all die. Uh, that's the doomsday clock, and they just unveiled it. I, uh, yeah, I'll show you a little bit of the unveiling. This was actually last year, because this year was sort of a non-announcement because it was the same time as last Today, year. <gasps> the members of the Science and Security Board move the hands of the doomsday clock forward, largely, though not exclusively, because of the mounting dangers in the war in Ukraine. We move the clock forward the closest it has ever been to midnight. It is now 90 seconds to midnight. You would think if they were the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, they could find a little bit of film crew that could uh, (laughs) maybe put some background music, like some ominous music or something. This picture, I... I probably shouldn't laugh, but they just stood there for literally 30 seconds. And here's the, here's the funny thing. They're there for a photo op, but how do you smile when you just reveal that we're all going to die in 90 seconds? And you look, all of them have this gloomy look, and they have to hold that gloomy look. She almost cracked a smile. I almost see it. <laughs> she couldn't stand up there and look all depressed for that long. And so uh, maybe she thought about her grandchildren children and just smile a little bit. I don't know. But I thought, (laughs) that's the world gets together with the people who are supposed to know everything, and they reveal this clock that tells us we're 90 seconds from ultimate destruction, doomsday. Uh, We have a hope better than that. (laughs) Um, And they want, and basically the reason they do this is because they want us to somehow turn the clock back. And I'm thinking, okay, that's great, but we're all still going to die, so what's the point, you know? Um, (laughs) I've shown this before again. Here's reality. Maybe you don't want to hear it, but time only moves in one direction. And if the Lord tarries, this is what's ahead of us. Sickness, aging, suffering, conflicts, persecution, disaster, death, and doomsday. You have a hope that goes beyond those things. And like I've said before, if you don't have a hope that is greater than sickness, aging, suffering, conflicts, persecution, disaster, and death, you have no hope. That's reality. You have to have a hope that is stronger than all of those things. And I only know one who is stronger than all those things, which he's proven. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. You probably hear me say at every funeral, if you know a Savior that has conquered death, go follow them. I only know one. I have cast my lot with Jesus Christ. I don't understand everything in Scripture. Uh, There's times I deal with anxiety. There's times I deal with worry. There's times I'm discouraged. But then I go back to what my foundation is, and my foundation is not my emotions. It's not even my faith. (laughs) My foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ, and thankfully he has faith in me uh, and has given me faith even when I don't have it in myself. He is our foundation, and therefore we have hope, and his words will not pass away. 
So we're to be, what, uh, be hopeful, but the second thing we're to be is be careful. Because then he says, but, verse 36, but of that day and hour no one knows, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two, men will, two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. I think the being careful is this. No one knows the timing of that day except God the Father. Uh, that should be one thing that we all say the Bible guarantees. As soon as someone gives you a date, I can assure you it's not going to happen on that date. <laughs> uh, why? Because no one... Who would want to be around the guy who finally figured it out all through eternity? And he's talking about, I'm the one that got it right. No. Uh, God says no one knows. The angels don't know. Even some translations say, or some parallel passages, even the Son doesn't know. And I think that's Jesus speaking in his humanity. He had limited his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence when he took on human flesh. And I think he's just communicating, hey, even in my human body at this time, I have limited my knowledge, and I don't know. And so anyone that claims that they know, just immediately turn them off. because And don't buy the thing, well, this says day and hour, and so we can figure out the week or the month. Don't, don't buy that. What he's trying to say is very clear. It's not for us to know the times and the seasons which God has put in his own authority. That's not our calling. Second thing you can know is nothing in the regular course of life will indicate that the day is about to occur. He says that when that day comes, it's going to be like the days of Noah. And the days of Noah, people were just marrying and giving in marriage and eating and drinking and just having a good old day. It was just a normal day until the flood came. Uh, in Luke's parallel passage, he says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left, but the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. And so both Noah and Lot are used as illustrations. And even even if you take this out of the context of the the day of the Lord or the end of uh, time. None of us know. I mean, how many times have people woke up on a normal day pursuing their normal routine and something happens that day that changes everything? Uh, that is reality that we live in. And so that's going to be the case. The third thing I would say is this, though, no believer will be left behind on that day. This is interesting. This is where it gets really interesting. Verses 40 through 41, two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two men will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Is this referring to the second coming when Christ comes back and reigns on earth, or is it referring to the rapture? Uh, most teachers that I were taught under in the dispensational camp would say this is the second coming because... Uh, the church is not in view in the Olivet Discourse. It's focused on Israel. Uh, he just talked about the second coming there in verses 29 through 31. And so it's talking about the second coming. If you read Walford this week, he believes this is not the rapture. It's the second coming. I have a great respect for them. That was probably the view I held just even two weeks ago. <laughs> but I read a, some papers by a guy named John Hart. He's a Moody Bible Institute a Bible professor and it was pretty convincing to me, and I do believe this is talking about the rapture. Why? Well, here's, here's some reasons. One, now concerning in verse 36. Verse 36, my translation just says, but. But it's an interesting phrase. It's peride, which in Greek means now concerning. It's, you can see it all through the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul, going from one topic to the next, says now concerning, now concerning, now concerning. And so it's a more than just a slight break. It seems to be a huge break. He's told them how the world's going to end. Now he's going to tell them when. And that's why he goes from what you can know to what you can't know. So there's a big change in subject in verse 36. I believe that day refers to the day of the Lord. In the Old Testament, the day of the Lord is not just a singular day. It is the day when God decides it's payday someday. And he begins to... Uh, 
bring his judgment on the earth. Um, it's interesting because it would be very hard to say that, that there's no... If this is referring to the second coming, then we can figure out when the second coming is. <laughs> it's three and a half years from the abomination of desolation. It's 1,260 days according to Revelation 11. And so this would not be much of a surprise, but the rapture is a surprise. There's no signs preceding the rapture, the imminence of the rapture. Uh, this says life will be going on as normal. Uh, in the tribulation, do you think life is going to be going on as normal? <laughs> it says this is like uh, the greatest time of destruction and persecution uh, that the world has ever seen. I just don't think life is going on as normal. Uh, Paul alludes to the rapture as a thief in the night, which Jesus is going to do just a few verses later. Here's where the interesting uh, interpretive thing comes. It says, in verse four, it says in verse 39, they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Verse 40, then two men will be in the field, one will be taken. And so people say, well, in context, the taken has to be taken in judgment because the people in verse 39 were taken in judgment. That's English. If you look at the Greek, these are two different words. One is a Greek word, uh, aero, which makes, basically means swept away. This one in verse 40 is a totally different Greek word. It's paralambana, which means to take to oneself. One is to take away, to sweep away. One is when you take something to yourself. The exact same word used in John 14, 3, which says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Same word. So don't let English mess up your understanding because it's a different taken away. Left is also an interesting Greek word. The one that will be left, it's a word, a fiami, which is used in context of divorce. When you send someone away, it's used in being abandoned. Uh, Jesus says, if I go away from you, I will not leave you as orphans. It means to be abandoned, to be um, divorced from. It has a very strong term, and so to be left here cannot be, uh, I think to me, that is the ones who are abandoned. And then finally, God delivers his people from his wrath to come. So how does this work? I think what Jesus is doing is he switched from how the world's going to end, which is the tribulation, to when is the world going to end. And when is the world going to end is generally called the day of the Lord. This is when things kick in. Uh, this, if you read Revelation, this is the time the Lamb takes the scroll, which I think is the title deed of earth, and he says, okay, the time has come for me to take back this earth. <laughs> the Lamb's the only one that can fulfill that promise. And so that's the beginning of the day of the Lord. When that Lamb starts opening the seals in Revelation, everything kicks in. Uh, this is the day where God brings judgment on the earth. In the Old Testament, wail for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. So how does the rapture fit into that? Well, if the day of the Lord is the day when God's wrath starts to be poured out on this world, here's what uh, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So I think when Jesus starts talking about the day of the Lord and when that kicks in, he knows, and I think he just revealed just a little bit of a rapture that's going to take place before that. God has not appointed us for wrath. Before wrath fell on the earth, what did God do with Noah and his family? He put them in an ark. Uh, before wrath fell on, on Sodom and Gomorrah, what did God do? He rescued Lot and his uh, family. What is God going to do before his wrath is poured out on this earth? I believe he's going to he's going to snatch us up. <laughs> and and I, I have a paper out there at the Welcome Center, Why I be Believe in the Rapture. I know it seems to be, have come into disrepute to some regard in today's world. Um, but I hold to that view. And here's another practical reason why I hold to it. If I did not believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, then I'll be very blunt and honest. I would not want Jesus to come back in my lifetime. And you say, ooh, why did he say that? Because that would mean I'd have to go through seven years of the worst thing that had ever happened on the earth. Who wants to do that? <laughs> 
God and to, to, for my focus then would be on, man, how bad is it going to get? How bad is it going to get? Can I make it through? But now my focus is on my blessed hope. Jesus Christ is coming back. He could come back today. He could come back tomorrow. And just in a moment, Paul says, behold, I tell you a mystery. Uh, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we'll all be changed. In a moment, he said, for this uh, corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And when this corruption has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then will come to pass what the scripture says, death has been swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, we have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And so I think Jesus is giving a very early, just like he did in uh, Matthew 16, when he mentions the church and the disciples have to be saying, what in the world is he talking about? The church. I think here he is giving us a glimpse of the rapture that before this comes in, the church is going to be gone. And so we are to be watchful. And that's why he says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Christ could come back at any moment, even so come Lord Jesus. Some of us are going to cheat the undertaker. I pray it happens in our generation. Uh, the Son of Man will come like a thief in the night. Does a thief announce and t send you a little note in the mail saying, hey, by the way, going to come rob your house tomorrow night about 11 o'clock if you could just make sure you stay in bed so no one gets hurt. Uh, that's not how it works. They show up when it's unexpected, and it could happen at any moment. We are always to be watching and waiting. Whenever I think of watching and waiting, <laughs> I can't help but think of my dog. <laughs> uh, this is my dog. I'm home, by the way. I took the picture. Um, she could care less that I'm home because my dog is a, it's called a Velcro dog. It's a Havanese, and they're called Velcro dogs because they attach to one person, and that person becomes the love of their life. And that person in my household is my wife, Liz. Um, she decided early on that all of life was centered around Liz. That's why she got the name Shadow, because no matter where Liz goes, Shadow follows her everywhere. And if Liz has the audacity to close the door while she's in the restroom, Shadow will stand outside the door and go, oh! And it's like, Shadow, I'm here. Shadow, I'm here. Oh! It's the saddest thing I've ever seen. And when Liz leaves, she'll do the same thing. She'll, she'll wail. And... Uh, yeah, Liz, no, I, I'm wailing too. I mean, part of me is like, okay, I get it, Shadow. I'm feeling the same way. Um, so here she is. She's... Uh, coming? Shadow, where's Mommy? Is Mommy coming? Is Mommy coming? Where's Mommy? Is she coming? Where's Mommy? Is she coming? Is she coming? Is she coming? Where is she? Where is she? Uh, we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Every time you deal with sickness, every time a loved one dies, every time you're just so frustrated that your body is not working the way it's supposed to, Deep down, you're groaning. Every time there's a natural disaster, every time there's a tragedy and justice in this world, all of creation is groaning, and it's longing for the day when Jesus Christ returns. Um, Titus, for the grace of God that brings salvation, has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying, all, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. 
Lord, give me such a heart for Jesus Christ that I long, uh, eagerly await uh, his return. Um, I, I had, couldn't help but think of this song, uh, Perfect Submission, All is at Rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long, watching and waiting. Uh, we're going to pause for just a second. I'm going to cover this last point quickly, but before we do, will you just take a moment just to reflect? Uh, Ryan's going to lead us in uh, a song and just reflect and just allow God to just minister to your heart. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting. I'm looking above. Filled with his goodness, I'm lost in his love.
<laughs> Amen. I would just say, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, what are you waiting for? <laughs> you have no guarantee. Uh, this life could end today. Uh, your life could end today. We just don't know. And so, how would you refuse a love that loved you enough that it entered this world, it went to the cross, it took your sin, he took your sin upon himself to offer you his righteousness. If it's your stubbornness or your doubts or whatever it is, I pray you would yield this morning and receive Jesus as your Savior. If you know him, here's what he says. The last thing I would say is this, be faithful. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Underline those two words, faithful, wise. I guess underline servant too. Whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he'll make him ruler of all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and in an hour that he's not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. How does God want us to live in the last days? I would say the way he wants us to live in the last days is the same way he calls us to live every day. We're to always be living in the reality that at any moment we could be before our creator, we could be before our savior. I'm to submit my life to the Lord. I begin every day offering my body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. I encourage you every morning to say, Lord, uh, my life is yours. Use me today. I'm to love and care for others. Uh, notice that this servant is called the feed uh, those in the household, to feed, care for them. I'm to love others as Christ has loved me. I'm to walk in holiness. I'm not going to be drawn away by the temptations of this world, but I'm going to walk in integrity and holiness. And I'm to live with eternity in mind. I'm to live every day, quorum deo, before the face of God, knowing that at any moment I could meet the one who created me and the one who saved me. I'm to live with the end in mind, and I'm to live for those things uh, which glorify my Lord and Savior. And I'm to do what God has called me to do. To be faithful, I always go back to First Peter. If you want to know, when people get uh, sort of excited because they think the Lord is coming back and, they, and maybe they hear some preacher that seems, says it's going to happen this day or whatever, I say, here's how you're supposed to live no matter what. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Be on your knees praying Pray for those that need Jesus. Pray for our nation. Pray for family members. Uh, be a person of prayer. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. Love covers a multitude of sins. If you have issues with someone, resolve them. If you haven't forgiven someone, forgive them. If you have bitterness in your heart, deal with it. Uh, don't face the Lord with uh, unresolved or with at least the attempt to do what you could as much as possible to have peace. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Don't run to the hills in Montana and set up in a bunker. Instead, open up your home. I challenge you this week, if you know someone that doesn't know the Lord or someone that maybe is drifting away, uh, just invite them to lunch. Uh, do something this week to be hospitable. Maybe you don't want them to come to your house. Well, take them out <laughs> somewhere. But do something to just connect with another person. And finally, as each one received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That's what God wants you to live like every day and especially in the last days. Be a person of prayer. Be one that loves others. Be hospitable. Open up your home and your heart and whatever gift God's given you, use it for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we give you praise. You're worthy of all praise. Uh, thank you that we have a hope that goes beyond the grave and we say with the church, even so, come Lord Jesus. If someone here doesn't know you, I pray they would quit fighting, quit running, um, Father, bring them to a place where they say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm separated from you. I'm tired of running. Right now, I trust you alone as my Savior and Lord. And Father, if they make that prayer in their heart, may they confess it with their mouth. Father, we love you, and uh, we eagerly await your return in your Son. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.